After Nigerian second military coup of July 1966, we saw the death of his first military president and that of over 200 officers from the eastern region, the future of the country after six years of independence was anything but promising. To make matters worse, in the months following the coup, a series of pogroms arose in the northern region that led to the deaths of over 30,000 Easterners, particularly of the Igbo ethnicity. Soon, many of the surviving Easterners began to return to the East with horrific tales of what they had witnessed in the North. Exactly how many refugees poured into the Eastern region between mid-September and 31st of December 1966 will never be precisely known. Many have estimated it to be between 1 and 2 million people from the North and half of that from the other two regions. The new military ruler, Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowon, made several promises to put a stop to the killings in the north, but even after delivering a series of broadcasts intended to put an end to the killings, it continued. Gowon also made plans for all military governors in Nigeria under the framework of the Supreme Military Council to meet and sort out ways of distilling the crisis in the country. But Lieutenant Colonel Ojuku, the military governor of the eastern region, who refused to recognize Gowon's leadership, refused to attend any meeting within Nigeria for safety reasons. Finally, on the 4th and 5th of January 1967, General Akran of Ghana agreed to host the officers on his territory at Aburi. A lot was discussed and agreed upon during the meeting at Aburi, but the fulcrum of the agreement was that each region would be responsible for its affairs and that the federal military government would only be responsible for matters that affected the entire country. At the end of the meeting, Ojuku and Gowon shook hands and promised to abide by what they had agreed. But on the 26th of January 1967, Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowon gave a press conference rejecting the main points agreed upon at Aburi. Ojuku immediately responded by issuing an edit that all federal revenues collected in the East, excluding oil, would thereafter be diverted internally to deal with the problems of the displaced people in the Eastern region. The mere mention of oil revenues sent shivers down the collective spine of the Supreme Military Council. You see, most of Nigeria's oil is located in the minority non-Igbo region of the East. Gowon responded almost immediately by issuing Decree No. 8, which gave him absolute power over the affairs of any regional government in the country. Ojuku promptly rejects this decree and begin plans for the secession of the Eastern region from the Republic of Nigeria. To prevent the East from seceding, Gowon divided the four regions of the country into 12 states. He cleverly divided the eastern region into three states, separating the core Igbo territory from the minority regions where most of the oil in the country was located. In early May, Gowon imposed a blockade in the eastern region, and this was the final straw. On the 30th of May 1967, Lieutenant Colonel Chuku Emeka Odomegu Ojuku declared the independence of the eastern region and he renamed it the Independent Republic of Biafra. In the months that followed, a sense of calm before the storm descended on the new nation. The population of Biafra held its breath in anticipation. Do you think that it will be necessary to use military force to bring down Colonel Juku's regime? Yes, it is necessary. I think I have made this point before that if the integrity corporate uh, existence of this country is threatened, I will use force to maintain it. If civil war comes, and I do think it is imminent, you're quite right, it will for us be the force of freedom. Our people here have for a long time been prepared for this eventuality and I am confident of their readiness. I think that when it does come, that the people on the other side would be surprised as to what they're going to get and I'm confident that it will not last long.